Thank you, folks. Good afternoon. My name is Norman Barbosa. I'm a computer crimes prosecutor from the U.S. Attorney's Office up in Seattle. Uh, my co-counsel, Harold Chun, is a former trial attorney from Maine Justice in Washington, D.C. He's now with Google. Uh, he took the big money after we won this case. And I'm happy to have him here with me. I, I also have to thank a friend of ours in the audience who supplied the laptop because as I was coming here yesterday, um, my computer started screaming and immediately had an error that said I'm about to experience a catastrophic failure and I thought well it's either these guys or the FSB, I'm not really sure. Um, I recognize many of you play the game Spot the Fed. We amongst the trial team on the Selesnev case play Spot the FSB agent. Uh, if you see one let us know. Uh, the original title to this, uh, to this presentation was nixed by our minders. Uh, I wanted to go with Ochko123, why you shouldn't use butthole123 as the password to your hacking empire. It doesn't work well. Uh, this, uh, this is a rare opportunity for us uh, in the Department of Justice community to talk uh, at length about the evidence that we develop in a prosecution in a computer crimes case. What actually convinces a jury of attribution, the issue that many of you deal with. Um, what is it that we actually need to present to, a, to a, a jury of 12 people to convince them that this was the man behind the computer? And because he went to trial and we were in a situation where we had to lay out all the evidence in such detail, there is a lot more in the public sector, in the public files, and than there is in most cases that resolve by a plea or, or um, just don't go to trial. Uh, we were really lucky to have the opportunity to try this case, Harold and myself uh, and another attorney from my office, Seth Wilkinson. It was a long investigation and, and we didn't indict this case. We didn't investigate this case either. Uh, another assistant U.S. attorney from my office who retired before Roman's capture uh, led the investigation. Her name was Catherine Warma and she was my mentor in the office, an excellent computer crimes attorney. And she worked it up with a, an agent who had also left the government before the capture. David Dunn, who I'm sure many of you might know, he's uh, uh, here this week, uh, an excellent investigator who we were lucky enough to work with and he came back for the trial. Uh, out, quick outline of what we're going to do today. I'm going to go through the investigative stage of this case and the capture and then Harold's going to talk about some of the evidence that we retrieved as a result of Roman's arrest, uh, the forensic challenges that came up uh, during trial and how we dealt with those. So a little overview of uh, Mr. Seleznev. Uh, he was one of the world's largest traffickers in stolen credit cards between approximately 2005 and his capture in 2014. Uh, before he was captured, he had been indicted in three different federal courts for a variety of computer crimes. Um, he's a Russian national. He had homes in Vladivostok, Moscow, as well as Bali, Indonesia. And between 2011 and when we finally got him in 2014, we had made several attempts to capture him uh, without success. Uh, his political ties and his father's uh, position in the Russian government were a significant issue in the case, uh, can't be ignored. Uh, there was a lot of tension between our governments as a result of his capture in the Maldives in 2014. Uh, unfortunately, as a result of that, myself and the rest of the trial team were blacklisted by the Russian government. We're no longer allowed to travel there. Um, hopefully those tensions will resolve at some point. I'd like to go to Russia again someday. I actually studied uh, Russian language in Moscow. Uh, but at the moment, uh, none of us can go there. Uh, he made a lot of money as a result of this scheme, which also uh, was a driving factor, I think, in uh, some of his efforts to, frankly, obstruct justice during the, during the course of this trial. So he had a very well-financed defense team, too. His history as a carter on the internet really breaks down into three chapters. And these chapters uh, trace the different online identities he used, the NICs that he used in the carding forums and in his sales across the internet. Uh, between 2002 and when we captured him, he, he went through three different periods uh, of, as a hacker. His first as NCUX, he then moved into using the identity track two and finally Tupac before he was arrested. His NCUX identity uh, he began establishing as early as 2009. Um, he showed up on a variety of carding forms including this one here that you see 
uh, a uh, quick snippet of from Carding World. This is a post from 2009, um, but he had been on several carding forums and other hacking forums since 2002, largely involved in trading and stolen identity information, not credit cards, but full identities, names, dates of birth, social security numbers. By 2005, he'd picked up on the fact that, that credit cards were a very valuable uh, and easy way to monetize hacking and he got into credit card hacking and the sales of credit cards pretty heavily. That resulted in him uh, getting on the radar of the Secret Service Cyber Intelligence Section in DC. They began uh, following him on the internet, uh, noticing that he had become a big player, and collecting information about who this might be, who might be NCUX. And uh, we keep use, I keep using that name, NCUX. It actually transliterates in Russian to seek uh, or psycho, which was a nickname that many of his friends had given him because he was a bit of a hothead. So Secret Service CIS is following him since 2005. By 2009, they had developed quite a bit of information uh, just based on open source uh, trolling of the internet, uh, digging good old fashioned detective work. And they had come to the conclusion that he was probably Roman V. Seleznev of Vladivostok. They approached the FSB in 2009 along with the FBI and had a meeting in Moscow where they shared a great deal of information about their investigation, including their belief that the, su the suspect known as Sikh was probably Roman Seleznev. Unfortunately, approximately a month later, Sikh completely disappeared from the internet. He closed all of his accounts. He made this post as well as several others on the carding forums that he was retiring and going out of business forever. Um, kind of putting the Secret Service investigation back a step and causing them to rethink how they would go about seeking international cooperation on the case. Obviously, he hadn't actually retired. Um, he had just began establishing his newest empire and his newest identities, Track 2 and Bulba, which he used between 2009 and 2012. This post here on the internet, the carding forum Carter SU from September of 2009 is one of the first posts he put, as, put up as track two. In September 2009, in fact, this is from the very day that he joined Carter SU. And it was significant to the Secret Service because the first day he shows up on this carding forum, which was one of the largest at the time, he's immediately listed as a trusted vendor of dumps, which is in the upper left-hand corner of this slide here of that post. And what that told the Secret Service was, well, this isn't just some brand new hacker, some brand new carter that has a small stash of credit cards. This is somebody who already must have some kind of reputation in the background of the carding community. You don't just come on to Carter SU on day one and get listed as a trusted vendor of dumps. And in fact, he was actually given a monopoly on Carter SU for some time where the administrators of, of the forum would kick off other carters who offered their wares for sale. So CIS realizes this is, this is probably a big player. This is somebody they're going to immediately put on their radar. And by May of 2010, they had opened up an investigation and were looking pretty hard at track two. About the exact same time, Detective David Dunn in Seattle, who was a member of our local uh, e-crimes task force, is called to an intrusion at a Schlotsky's Deli in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho up in the panhandle. And when he goes out there, uh, he images uh, computers, he images their point of sale systems, and he grabs RAM, and he immediately finds that Schlotsky's is beaconing out to a Russian IP address. He starts putting together that case. There's not a whole lot to go on. A couple weeks later, maybe a month or so later, a, a large volume of cards that had traced back by common point of purchase analysis to the Schlotsky's uh, intrusion were found on a suspect's computer in Idaho. And Secret Service contacted Detective Dunn. They knew that he was involved in the, in the Schlotsky's investigation and said, hey, you know, we got something. We have an image of this guy's computer. You want to take a look at it. Detective Dunn uh, looks into that computer and on the suspect in Ohio's computer, he found that that suspect had been br browsing these two websites, track2.name and bulbacc and they had been chatting with somebody with the neck track two who told him, hey, my site track two dot name is closed, but my reseller bulba.cc is somewhere you can get the numbers. 
So Detective Dunn, he looks at these sites, and what do you think? They definitely appear to be the same guy, and he decides, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into these sites. Let's see what we can find about who is running these two vending sites. And his goal was to look into the domain registrations, just basic uh, internet research, find the, dom the emails that were used to register those domains, search any U.S.-based email accounts that might have been involved in it, and see what he could find. Uh, the Eastern District of Virginia begins supporting the case in conjunction with, uh, main, uh, with Secret Service CIS, and they began obtaining warrants in September of 2010. While Detective Dunn is waiting for those warrant returns, that often takes quite a while to get, but it, this is not a process that, that happens overnight. Uh, he's probably waiting uh, weeks for the warrant returns to come back from the various email providers. At about, uh, as he's waiting, there's another intrusion in his backyard. This is a, a photograph of the Broadway Grill, which was a restaurant that had run uh, on Capitol Hill in Seattle for many, many years. Uh, Detective Dunn gets a call from a bank investigator in, in the Seattle area. He says, we just noticed a huge spike in fraud coming back to Broadway Grill. I think you've got to go out there. He goes out, and right off the bat, him and another detective, as they're examining the image of their point-of-sale system, finds that their computers had been configured very poorly and unfortunately had 32,000 credit card numbers stored in plain text that had gone out to the same IP address that he'd seen at Schlotzky's Deli. And as he dug a little further, he found that whoever had planted the malware on Broadway Grill had manually browsed to his malware server by typing in an address that corresponded with the same IP address that he'd seen at Schlotzky's Deli. And so he realizes, well, now I've got a case in my backyard. I'm going to open up a case in the Western District of Washington and I no longer have to travel to Virginia or Idaho to deal with my process, which is pretty fortunate for our office, because at that point the case really, really sped up. Um, he's pulling the Whois records for the vending sites, searching the Yahoo registering email accounts, and as he's going through the Yahoo email accounts, he finds some leads to a server in McLean, Virginia. Um, the or original uh, intrusion that kicked this off, the Schlotzky's Deli intrusion, the numbers were being sent off to a server in Russia. But as he's looking at the Yahoo accounts, he finds that right as his investigation is going on, the suspect running those Yahoo accounts had bought a server at Hop One Servers in McLean, Virginia, which was a huge break in his case. He was able to get a pen trap on that server. A pen trap is a, a legal process that allows us to examine the connections coming in and out. It doesn't allow us to examine content, but it gives us the IPs that are coming in and the IPs that are going out, as well as some other data, uh, port, port numbers, um, volume of data. And he sees that this server is connecting to hundreds of computers all over the country, that he quickly realizes many of them are restaurants. And as he begins to research more of those IP addresses, he sees a pattern that almost every one of these IPs that is connecting to the Hop1 server are restaurants that appear to be running a similar point of sale system. And as a result of that, he starts identifying dozens of victims all over the country. In addition, uh, he begins pulling apart some of the malware, and this is just some of the this is some of the uh, forensic evidence that Detective Dunn had pulled off of the Schlotzky's Deli system, um, another victim, Grand Central Baking and Broadway Grill, that shows some of the connections, including these IPs and the uh, manually entered uh, uh, malware server that I'd talked about earlier. These exhibits uh, helped him put together kind of the infrastructure, or these, these, this evidence helped him put together the infrastructure of Roman's entire uh, hacking empire. And not a terribly complicated one. This isn't a botnet with all kinds of multiple layers of stuff. Um, this was pretty basic. You've got Roman sitting up in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, Detective Dunn had found a number of his hacking tools on the Hop1 server that showed that he was just doing some basic port scanning, looking for open RDP connections whenever he found one he'd hit it with a brute force password attack or the password that he'd figured out that all of them were using at the same time, get into the victim's POS system and start siphoning off numbers to one of his three collection servers, which were the, the Hop1 server, the Ukraine server, and the Schmack and Smouse server. The search of the Hop1 server 
ultimately led to a discovery of hundreds of files. We found approximately 400,000 credit card numbers on that computer and they were all stored very conveniently for us uh, by the IP number of the victim that had sent them. Uh, Roman had configured his malware to post them automatically and create a file with a uh, named by the IP number of the uh, IP address of the victim and so we were able to quickly identify the victims and start getting out notifications and collecting more evidence. As he went through the email accounts, this is where the case uh, really broke open and we got to some strong evidence of attribution. This is one of the first emails that Detective Dunn found uh, tied to Roman's infrastructure. This is from an account that we uh, called the Ruben Sembelich account. If I go back to our infrastructure slide, you'll see that that was an email account that was used to register his track to vending site. And in that email account, he found that Roman had at least once made the mistake of using it for some of his personal business, opening up a PayPal account. Fortunately, another American business that we were able to uh, serve legal process upon and get copies of his records you'll see there's a home address listed in the bottom right hand, uh, bottom corner of that, Austria Kova 25 Kova 113. Uh, that was his home address that was later found in his passport at the time of his ar arrest. Uh, the second account that we'd found which had been used for many years, is another uh, error in Roman's operational security, he had used this account Books Cafe at Yahoo.com uh, since as early as 2006. So it was tied to not just his Track 2 infrastructure, but it went back many, many years through his days as NCUX. And we found a number of things tracing back to him, including a flower order that he had placed for his wife in his own name with a phone number that showed up in other records tied to him uh, with a, a message uh, to her. Uh, in that it is said, you are the most beautiful, but little Ava is more beautiful than all. His daughter's name is Ava, which was also in his uh, passport at the time of his arrest. We also found an order he had placed uh, with a Russian internet uh, store, uh, again, sent to an address that was one of his, one of his addresses in Vladivostok. And finally, uh, we found a great deal of attribution evidence on the Hop1 server itself. In addition to using that to collect um, the stolen credit card numbers, host malware, host some of his hacking tools. He would often do his private internet browsing on that and make his travel reservations. And we found this very convenient cached uh, order for a ticket uh, with his full passport number on it, which again matched the passport that was found on him at the time he was arrested. And this was for a, a trip to Indonesia where he had a second home. Uh, so the Secret Service is putting this all together, um, locking down the evidence of attribution. The cyber intelligence agents that were on the case and helping out Detective Dunn, uh, they began combing through other evidence that they still had in their files from other cases. And that, this, is, this is one of the more interesting things I learned as I was going about this investigation and I think it really illustrates how so many of these cases are intertwined and many of these players over the years know each other and work with each other. This chat is from an investigation in the Eastern District of New York. Uh, the chat is from 2007, but that investigation had started, I believe, as early as 2002 or 2003 involving the Carter Planet case, um, a very successful prosecution out of New York. Mr. Carranza, Cesar Carranza, was just one of many subjects uh, that were prosecuted there. He was prosecuted for money laundering. And on his computer that Secret Service had, was a chat between him and NCUX 111 in which NCUX 111, uh, not exercising any operational security at all, gives his full name and address as well as a couple of emails that tied to many of his carding, uh, carding forum registrations, which was another helpful exhibit further confirming his identity. So with all that evidence in hand, Detective Dunn and uh, AUSA Warmer, they went to the grand jury and obtained an indictment in 2011 charging him with a number of counts of bank fraud, computer crimes, uh, uh, possession of stolen access devices, trafficking in access devices, a very thorough indictment. And they began looking for him. Unfortunately, very shortly after Roman was indicted, he was injured in a serious terrorist attack in Morocco. This is the Café Argania in Morocco. Roman and his wife were sitting on the second floor there where most of the bomb damage was done. Um, and he was 
medevaced back to Moscow in pretty serious condition. He was in a coma for a couple of months, um, went through a number of surgeries. As this was going on, Detective Dunn continued to monitor uh, his websites, Bulba CC. Uh, he had a number of communications with him trying to see if this, you know, again, get further confirmation that Roman was in fact the hacker behind these. And he saw that Bulba CC no longer had as many numbers available. Somebody running the site for him would post things such as, sorry, the boss has been in an accident. You know, you got to hold on, you got to wait. And eventually the shop closed in uh, approximately, I think it was January of 2012 when Bulba CC closed. Uh, Detective Dunn, however, and uh, AUSA Warmer, they continued their efforts to find him. Uh, they had noticed that records show that he often flew through Korea to get to his house in Indonesia, uh, hopeful that he might, after he recovered, return to his, to his vacation home in Indonesia. Uh, they worked with Korean authorities to obtain a warrant for him there. Uh, the goal was hopefully to get him arrested in Korea and then extradite him to the United States. Unfortunately, he ended up getting direct flights to Indonesia after that. They had a false hit on, an, um, on a name similar to his in Germany. Whole fire drill, working up Interpol, last second, wait, no, that's the wrong guy, so Germany didn't work. There were some efforts to try and see if we could get him to go to Australia, if we, if we could possibly extradite him from, from there, efforts to get him out of Indonesia, none of which ultimately came to fruition. All the while, you might be asking, well, why didn't we ask Russia to extradite him? Unfortunately, um, Russia will not extradite their citizens. And as you'd seen earlier, we didn't have a great history of cooperation on the case with them. In the meantime, uh, Roman is starting up a new empire. This is, a, um, this is an ad from the last vending site that he was running, Tupac CC. And this is actually the ad that was on his desktop. It's probably beaconing out to the Russians right now. Um, that site had a huge volume of stolen credit cards and uh, again got immediately onto the radar of the cyber intelligence section because of the volume and as well as because of the, the source of those credit cards. He was vending, he'd, he'd become not just a seller of his own uh, exploits, he wasn't just selling the cards that he had hacked, he was so well respected that many of the biggest credit card hackers in the, in the world were coming him to resell their cards. He had cards from Home, and De Home Depot, Neiman Marcus, Target, uh, and a ton of other hacks. And he advertised on the carding forums as somebody to come to with your dumps and I'll get the best prices for him. Many of the chats that we ultimately seized on his computer showed just his, his business dealings as he worked, worked through that. He was doing very, very well. Uh, these are some photographs we found on his computer. Uh, a lot of tropical vacations, some pretty nice cars. Um, he was traveling primarily to the Maldives, Indonesia, a few trips to China, um, and just enjoying his time and enjoying the proceeds of his, of his hacking empire until he ended up here. That is the Hagatnya detention facility in Guam. So where did we find him? This is uh, the Maldives. I got a call the first, my first involvement in this case was around July 1st or 2nd, 2014. Uh, Catherine Warmer had put me as the secondary on, on the process for him, but I didn't really know what was going on. But I get a call as I'm coming into work on July 1st or 2nd, and it's a, a, an attorney in D.C., one of the supervisors in, in Harold's office, and he says to me as I'm illegally talking on my cell phone in my car, uh, hey, we found Roman Selesnev, he's in the Maldives. I'm like, where the hell is the Maldives and who is Roman Selesnev? <laughs> he says, you know, you got to get on this call right now. We've got like 20 people from the State Department. We've got people from DOJ, Secret Service, um, the embassies in Moscow and Sri Lanka. Get on the call, get on the call. All right, whatever, we'll see, see what's going on. Uh, this was an incredible operation to be a part of. Y your typical extradition in any given case can take anywhere from six months to three, four years, depending on the country you're dealing with. Um, we learned about Roman, Roman's vacation in the Maldives uh, July 1st. Secret Service agents were on the ground in the Maldives July 3rd. And on July 5th, in a three hour period of time, Roman landed at the main airport from his private beach vacation. Agents, uh, with the help of the Maldivian government, confronted him at the airport, showed him the arrest warrant, 
put him on a private jet, and he was on his way to Guam in about three hours. Uh, it was a, a very, very successful operation, an incredible example of helpful international cooperation in a, in a tricky situation. We do not have an extradition treaty with the Maldives, uh, but based on a, a formal request from our government where we emphasize the importance of this case and the significance of this player, they agreed to cooperate and handed him over to uh, Secret Service agents. So we had him in custody in U.S., on U.S. soil uh, by July 6. A little bit longer to get him into Seattle. He, he, fought, he fought for a while in, in Guam. Uh, I'm not really sure why, because that was a nasty looking uh, prison in Guam, but ultimately had his initial appearance in August. So I'm going to turn it over to Harold at this point. He's going to talk about some of the trial challenges we had. So not only was it a great thing that he was arrested, but you know what comes with an arrest? is a lot of evidence, typically. And that was very true of this case. When he was arrested, law enforcement was able to grab his laptop, his iPhone, his passport, his travel documents. And what these things did was confirm all of the attribution that had been gleaned throughout the invest investigation year after year in his emails from the servers and such. And you can see what occurs is you're able to then start matching things up. So where you had his email accounts and you saw things like NCUX, Smouse, Ochco, uh, repeatedly in various emails, it's just a pattern he used for his infrastructure of crime. You saw it over and over. Smouse, Schmack, Ochco. So what does law enforcement do when they sit down with the laptop and they're like, oh God, how do you get into this thing? <laughs> well, why don't we type that in? Ochko, one, two, three. And what do you know? They nailed it. <laughs> the case agent wanted me to say that it was his very first guess. Um, the slide, why you shouldn't use Ochko, one, two, three as the password to your hacking empire. I think Norm touched on it earlier, but Ochko in Russian means butthole. Um, and on that computer, what law enforcement was able to find was 1.7 million credit card numbers. There's not much to say when you have 1.7 million credit card numbers with you when you're on vacation. This was made the case more or less a slam dunk. It's really funny, this slide initially when we gave it to law enforcement had a whole bunch of credit card numbers. I was an exhibit from trial, and we we're like, we can't show that to this audience. Somebody's gonna go plug all of those in. <laughs> Edited for Black Hat. <laughs> what else was on his laptop? We found web pages he had set up. And like many of you in this room, he was also a marketer. And what he was trying to do was teach people how to use stolen credit card numbers. And so he had set up a site that taught them, whoever went to it, very much that. Right there in the middle it says, or on top it says, this is a tutorial how to buy dumps and use and store make and using fake credit card. And he wasn't you know, scared or nervous about someone knowing that this is illegal. He actually put it right there. This is the legal way. And he laid it out step by step. Because this was marketing for him. He knew if he could teach people that you could buy an MSR 206, you could buy dumps from his website, you can then start coding them on plastic cards and start using them in stores. This was how he was building his empire. You know what else was on that laptop? PACER records. I'm gonna guess many of you aren't familiar with PACER. PACER is the court docketing system for federal courthouses everywhere in the United States. And it's where indictments would be found, search warrant, motions, things of that sort. So usually lawyers sign up for it so that they can get their court documents. Well, Roman was clever. Before he traveled, he ran PACER searches for an account he had himself looking for his identity, his name, his nicknames. The downside is when that's found on your laptop after law enforcement arrests you, it becomes pretty obvious who you were. And you can see there in those boxes, he wasn't just looking for his own name, but he actually tied it back to his old aliases from years ago, like Bulba. So now you ask, laptop, 1.7 million credit cards, uh, 
lots of evidence on there. Why in the world would he go to trial? It's a great question. And he had a strategy. First, there was a general political thought is, you know, his father had some juice, and so perhaps they could put pressure on the United States to just give him over. So there are jail conversations about that. And when that didn't work, then there was other talk. One of them, hey, what about we bribe the prosecutor? <laughs> and here's a little snippet from a jail call. His father says, we can just pay them all in advance, and that's it. Roman says, it is what I'm saying. Offer them this. Dad? Yes, I am leaning towards this. I think it's an option. A Roman, just to make sure they know how much money they will get right away as they would get in a whole year. Now, later we heard that that number was about $10 million. I don't know who he thinks we work for, but we don't get paid that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what else this does? If there's talk about bribing a prosecutor, you know what it makes it really hard for a prosecutor to do? to plea a case out, right? Everything you do is now being scrutinized at that moment. <laughs> what else? There is talk on these jail calls about very strange things in code. And the codes all talked about an Uncle Andre, trips to the hospital, uh, magic potions and like sorcerers, fishing expeditions. There are very odd things in these calls. I might have made some of that up right now. Um, <laughs> And it came now, we actually were able to identify Uncle Andre. So this we call the Uncle Andre option, get out of jail. If you see him here in Black Hat or DEF CON this week, please tell security. We'd like to know. <laughs> and then lastly, they decided, hey, we'll put on the fence. And what's their defense going to be? They're going to try to say, I've been framed by somebody, whether that be the US government or uh, another hacker out in the world. And so that was the, uh, the defense they took at trial, that a hacker had planted all this evidence on his laptop, or the government planted all this evidence on his laptop. And he had one thing to hang his hat on, and is that there were thousands of files on his laptop that had a modified file date that was after his arrest. And what had occurred, and why that was true, is because when he was arrested in the Maldives and they took his laptop back from him, they never turned it off. And it was a new Windows 8 laptop that was basically like a tablet hybrid, and it was in connected standby. And so the operating system was on in the background, and so like antivirus would run every once in a while, it would make a check to do various things, and that caused file modified date changes. And so that was their... Oh, sorry, access date changes. And that was their defense. And so what did we do at trial and response? We called in our forensic experts and said, hey, you need to tell us what on this laptop proves that that theory is bunk. And our forensic experts came out with a theory of we're going to look at network logs, we're going to look at the users on the computer, and we're going to look at system activity to figure out who was on this computer last. And for the black hats out there, this is how the feds are going to try to catch you. Take note. <laughs> so he was running a Windows machine. And so they have, Windows just naturally has lots of artifacts. It's got things like registered keys, event logs, something called the System Resource Usage Monitor, or known as SRUM in the forensic world. There's a USN journal that basically logs activity throughout the use of a computer. And then shadow volume copies. You know, Windows is constantly doing, creating Windows restore points so that something goes wrong, you can go back to it. Well, forensics could also go back to it as well to pull files out from it. And so what were they able to show? Well, the first thing, go back to network connections. They were able to show that forensics showed that Kanafushi was the last wireless network that this computer had connected to. And it gave a rough date of connecting initially on Saturday, June 21st, and last disconnecting or so on July 3rd. Well, what is Kanafushi? Kanafushi was the name of the resort he was staying at in the Maldives. And I just want to point out, the life of a hacker definitely pays well because that was a $20,000 stay at that hotel there, if you can see on the receipt. He was doing well for himself. Uh, what else did they look at for network? So this laptop actually had cellular capability. So they looked at what SIM card was in there and the forensics showed that the last connection was Megaphone Russ, 
or a cellular connection from Russia. What else did they look at? They looked at event logs, and similarly, the event logs showed that the Kanafushi network was the last one connected to. And there are numerous event logs. And so we've edited here, but at trial, we basically had forensic artifact after artifact showing these things in numerous places on his computer. And then we went to the security event log to start looking at who was the last actual user to sit at this computer and type on it. And what you saw was it wasn't some remote connection, like somebody would be connecting from the internet. But no, it was a login from a user, Smouse, which was the original user on this laptop set up by Roman Celeste. What else could you see? You can see through the SRUM, which is recording all of the activity on this computer, that the last actual program to be run by a person, and I, we know it's an individual and not the operating system based on that user ID, you can see it there as S-1-5, et cetera, long number. Going back a slide, you actually see it right there above in the security ID. Those two line up saying that's the actual user. And what was the last activity? It was a Tor browser. That was the actual last activity. And then if you looked at pages after pages of the SRUM, what you saw was no longer user activity, but even the last three rows there, the, SI, the S1518 was the operating system itself. It was just automatic features on Windows running, never any human intervention. And that's what the forensics showed here. And where else was uh, exhibits found from? I can just go through these. Generally, law enforcement, for this case, we looked at deleted files, so searching Slack space for things he had deleted. Archive of evidence. I talked again about the shadow volume copies. For all of our trial exhibits, absent one, I believe, we were able to actually go into the shadow volume copy and extract the entire exhibit, the entire file would had an earlier date stamp on it, showing that that was actually on the computer well before his arrest, showing that it was there when he was using the computer. And then where else is law enforcement looking at where we found a lot of evidence here, which we didn't talk about much here, um, in the cloud, on his phone. He had photographs, uh, he had backup documents, he has passport, everything was saved in numerous places tying him together to his laptop, his external infrastructure, and to items he had on him, like his passport. And so what did that end in? Well, that's him in a great shirt convicted in really a matter of a few hours by a Seattle jury um, of 38 counts. And so that was the case of Roman Selesna. And uh, we'd like to open up to questions if there are questions here. It was... The, if, uh, if people could use the microphones when you're asking a question, I'll repeat this one. The question is that uh, the Maldives doesn't have an extradition treaty, and that's correct. It was not an extradition. Uh, this was an expulsion. The Mal we asked the Maldivian government if they would expel him into our custody on the basis of a U.S. arrest warrant and indictment, and they said yes. We didn't ask Indonesia. Ultimately, we decided not to. There's a question in the mic over there. Uh, were there any encryption hurdles that you had to overcome? Encrypted file system? Uh, anything that you guys could share on that? There was not. There actually wasn't encryption that was an issue here. <laughs> Lesson, you should encrypt devices. <laughs> yeah. do, you mind, uh, do you mind stepping to the microphone if you can? So, or, go ahead and s say the question and I'll repeat it for you. Sorry, yeah. Um, was he, okay, given he was only one person, obviously this is a whole empire, was anything more that was done other than just the one guy? Because, I mean, this, is, this didn't die with him. It is obviously, there's a lot of political components of this thing involved in this. There's a lot of other people, because you saw the other people responding to it. Did it just stop here, or did you continue the, well, obviously you can't say he did. But, yeah. <laughs> so let's put it this way. Well, we can't, we can't comment on open investigations or ongoing investigations, but I'm still employed. Crime has not gone away. 
I have job security and I will continue to work on this problem. Yeah. I would say also though, a lot of this criminal activity though was done by him, right? I mean that's, your question is did he have a huge team? He was very much the central figure to this. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so um, a couple of catastrophic operational security failures by this guy um, seem to make your jobs a lot easier. I'm thinking particularly in reference to the Alpha Bay case like just a few weeks ago of another catastrophic operational security uh, failure of you know, having your personal hotmail address in the headers for your you know, password reset for Alpha Bay. So, I mean, there seems to be a bit of a trend here. Have you noticed any more, any more of a shift towards better operational security by these actors, um, especially for these big players with sophisticated models? Uh, Do you want to go? Yes, I think that's true. I think operational security gets better and better. Um, this case is, you know, fairly dated for this criminal activity, and I would say, yes, operational security generally is better today. Um, I do think, though, the the hard part of an ongoing hacking empire, however, is keeping yourself, your online profile and your actual self separate completely. You know, your VPN fails sometimes, sometimes you have an IP leak, sometimes mistakes just happen on your, on your hardware. And if law enforcement sees that one mistake, it's something to run on. Um, a related question. How difficult do you think it would have been to convict him if, uh, you guys weren't able to crack or guess the password. Do you feel like with the evidence you collected prior to the accident, that would have been enough to convict him? I think we still would have convicted him with the evidence prior to the arrest. Um, it may have been a few more hours of deliberation, but it was, it was already very, very strong evidence. And we, we indicted it uh, without his laptop in custody uh, because we believed we have a, had evidence that would prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was the one responsible for this. Um, and so I, th I think we still would have convicted him. What was the, sorry, I have a follow up. What was the reason for the delay then for after the accident to wait till 2014 to get? You know? Oh, uh, just it, t it often takes a very long time for us to get lucky and, and, and get a tip as to where somebody might be. Uh, we, we were looking the whole time and hopeful that we'd, we'd catch him in a country that would cooperate with U.S. law enforcement. Um, but it just took, it just took that long uh, for us to get a lucky break. All right, I've got a comment and a, and a question. Thank you for doing this. Um, I spoke to a well-known Russian uh, attorney here in the United States who offered to represent him, and, uh, and it didn't work out, and he later told me he called him uh, hard-headed and an idiot. Um, so my question for you is, uh, going back to that interaction with the FSB, I want to know if you learned anything from that interaction and if that has changed the way law enforcement here in the U.S. reaches out to law enforcement over there since then. You know, I can't comment on, on, on the broader policy perspectives of that and, and, and how that may affect relations. That's, that's something more for, for people in D.C. This was also a long time ago. I can only say that it, it had an impact on this case. We had to take it into consideration in this particular case, and it impacted how we went forward. Just curious about sentencing. Uh, what did he get, and was it enough? <laughs> um, he got a lot. He got a lot of time. He was sentenced on April 21st uh, in federal court in, in Seattle. The judge sentenced him to 27 years in custody. Uh, his guideline rate, the U.S. sentencing system is based on uh, a series of guidelines that take into account a number of different factors, including the loss amount, which in this case was $169 million based solely on cards that we found on devices that we were able to seize, so that, that doesn't that unquestionably leaves a lot of money on the table. Uh, other factors that were very significant to the judge were this particular defendant's efforts to obstruct justice throughout the process. He testified in multiple hearings and, and lied repeatedly, and the judge saw through it and f specifically found that he had lied to the court in an effort to, uh, to sway particular rulings, which is never a good thing to do when you're going to be in front of that same judge for sentencing. Uh, the guidelines worked out uh, to uh, a calculation that was literally off the chart in the guideline book and, um, and called for a, a sentence of life. Uh, obviously, the sentence is not life. It was a departure quite a ways down from it. Uh, and that's what the judge felt was appropriate in light of all the sentencing factors. 
Yeah, and one part of that also that I think gets lost often in you know carding cases is victims. You know, a lot of people feel like, hey, I'm the card owner. You know, my card gets stolen. I was the victim. Well, another group are the businesses actually that got hacked, and he had hacked is it hundreds. We had approximately 400 victims, and most of our victims were not large, well-financed corporations. They were mom-and-pop shops, uh, restaurants that took a huge hit as a result of this. And a few of them completely went out of business. Broadway Grill ultimately declared bankruptcy uh, within months, yeah. uh, months or prob about a year of the intrusion. And so there is a, a larger effect on a community, and the, here it was really nationwide. We did not recover any funds at this point, um, which is also another problem in terms of international cooperation. Sometimes we just don't have ability to get a hold of the, the accounts where the money might be. Yes? I'm curious about Indonesia. Why did you decide not to contact Indonesia? I, you know, I can't comment on that. It was a decision that was made internally. Um, it just was an operation that we didn't go forward with. Uh, in the back? We did, um, we did multiple searches of it. We first had an Apple unlock order that produced a great deal of data uh, before Apple uh, ceased doing that. Um, and then later we were able to brute force the, the iPhone and uh, pulled a bunch of data off of it. But it was, I don't think we introduced any exhibits from the phone ultimately. Oh, yeah. Pictures, I think. But that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This gentleman just asked about two other cases that are currently pending. Obviously, I can't comment on ongoing litigation. Uh, he is pre presumed innocent until proven guilty on those cases. And I, so I can't comment on where that may lead. Those cases are, uh, are still there. He's currently in Atlanta. Um, and we'll just have to see how that plays out. Did you track uh, how many other Russian nationals stopped vacationing in Maldives following his arrest? <laughs> 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 Good question. No. <laughs> I was just wondering about the um, credit cards. What did you guys do afterwards? Did you contact the banks or the um, owners of the cards? Uh, all, all the banks, thousands. I, 3,000 banks was my 3,700 different 3, banks. 3,700 different banks were contacted and told about the cards that were discovered. I didn't know there were that many banks. <laughs> um, they were, and they were all over the world. Did we get the zero? Real close. Sorry, yeah. one quick question. How do you guys coordinate with other stakeholders in the U.S. government that might be uh, less excited about you using these techniques in an open forum like a trial? Um, and, and is it worth it? We is didn't, it worth it to put one guy in jail and blow other techniques other people use? Yeah. I don't think we actually blew any techniques that weren't yeah. public. Um, that wasn't a concern here. Yeah. But even just pointing out trade practices, other people work? Um, I guess we're okay with that since we're standing here, right? Yeah, yeah. We're telling you all about it. Um. Um, any last question here? I, was, I didn't quite hear, or maybe I missed it uh, during the presentation, about the tip that led to the Secret Service rushing in and grabbing him in the mm -hmm. Maldives. What was that tip? Who gave it? I, I can't tell you. It's not public. <laughs> um, yeah, one more. Sure. So um, a lot of the credit card information was in clear text on those businesses. Did they suffer any um, criminal liability for that, or what was most, their liability for holding that data on there? And most were not in clear text. There was the one example uh, where they had the 32,000 cards. And no, not, not criminal liability at all. Um, they all suffered some form of, of fines uh, and obviously loss of business. Um, in any given instance, there may have been very, a, a variety of security flaws that you know, we don't get into attribution of that. And we've been given the we're out of time mark. Uh, so thank, thank you guys you. very much.